All right, good evening everybody and welcome to uh, the uh, postponed but now in real life uh, section uh, three of our Bible study on Job. I was all ready to teach this two weeks ago and then got the fateful phone call that I had been exposed to someone who had tested positive for COVID and, uh, um, and, and uh, then the next two weeks of uh, of a kind of solitude uh, unfolded in my life, which if you know me, uh, it wasn't too great an imposition. I uh, had enough things to do around my house and uh, enough things to do work-wise that uh, I actually, the time uh, went by quite quickly and, and on, well, I wouldn't want to put myself through the entire experience again right away. Um, if it came along in six weeks that I had to sequester myself for a, a few days again, I, 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 I'd be okay with that, you know. So, and um, and uh, I did not, uh, as was perhaps feared by some, uh, you know, degenerate into some feral state in the basement. Um, we managed to keep a modicum of civilization through the whole thing as well. So. Anyway, um, give me some time to think about Job, though, and uh, the isolation that he experienced, you know, and he was really ill, and, uh, and how people back long, long time ago treated ill people. They, they, didn't, um, they weren't welcome much in society. They were kind of pushed to the edges, and that's where we have uh, seen Job and where we're going to see him uh, again this evening. So, but before we do that, I did have uh, the time to um, collect a couple of uh, pictures off of the internet uh, describing our Job-like 2020. Uh, this is on a t-shirt, um, uh, 2020 being given one star, <laughs> like a hotel, very bad, would not recommend. <laughs> And uh, that's sort of true. And then there's a little ring of truth to this one as well. It didn't, I, I should have cropped the picture a little bit. Uh, Going to ask my mom if that offer to slap me into next year is still on the table. <laughs> In case my mom actually is watching, she actually never made that offer to me. But uh, I can certainly understand taking someone up on it uh, the way the year has gone. And then someone submitted this one, and uh, if you find something you think we'd all enjoy as a chuckle, uh, by, by all means, feel free to do it. This might just take a minute to sink in, but... Um... Oh... <laughs> Yeah, well, anyway, my, my baggage actually got a little bit of a trip uh, two weeks ago when I found out that I had been exposed. Uh, one of the first actions was to go through my dresser and through my half of the closet and throw as much as I thought I might need for two weeks into a suitcase and take it downstairs. And, um, and um, at any rate, so my, my suitcase got a little trip this year. It's not anything near what it's been used to in some previous years. But anyway, a few, um, few uh, comical or uh, lighthearted uh, look at the year we're having so far. Now, if you're watching online um, and uh, want to know where to go get, to get this evening's lesson handout, uh, it's at the church website, should be the link just underneath uh, the Bible class link, and uh, you can click on that. And the bonus, if you go to the church uh, one, is you'll actually find that the date is right on it. Uh, those of you who are sitting here in the, uh, in the church uh, still have yours dated at September the 30th um, because we already had them run off. We were that ready to go and uh, we didn't, uh, we waste enough uh, as it is. We didn't think that was a significant enough thing to ditch all of these and if you want to write the date on it, you can. And then as always, we'll take uh, a couple breaks along the way uh, for questions and I have my cell phone here and uh, we'll um, uh, take any questions that come that are germane to the discussion. And uh, uh, I think that is sort of the preliminaries. What I, what I wanted to do to start us off tonight 
uh, was just, just to recap the story. It's been uh, you know, a full two weeks since we uh, were last going to meet, and which means it's three weeks since we first met and, uh, and four weeks since we began. And if we, I know a few people have said they're, they're kind of joining in as we're going. So I just want to recap um, the story of Job uh, for just a couple of minutes this evening. Uh, and we're going to do this uh, courtesy of something called the Brick Testament, um, which is an online uh, little experiment by uh, some folks who enjoy Lego and who want to uh, ha- have kind of put a lot of Bible stories uh, into Lego uh, so that uh, you can see, uh, see all these things in that sort of a way. And some of them with Job are actually kind of comical. And I think I, I pulled out some of the better ones that uh, uh, describe his plight. But you may recall that at the very beginning of the story, Job is you know, a man of, of, of leisure and uh, he's, oops, I don't have my fancy pen tonight, I have to use the mouse, but he's got his big house, he's, he's got his riches, and uh, even though these things uh, over here look like something from Star Wars, um, they're actually his camels, and there we go, a little interesting etch-a-sketch around them there. And he's, he's a very wealthy man. Uh, they said, you know, in, in, in Job, you know, the greatest man in the East, wherever uh, the East happened to be. And of course, the pride and joy of everything was his uh, family, his uh, sons and his daughters. And uh, there's the family uh, picture, according to Lego, all standing out there on the front steps of the house, looking very happy. And uh, as you may recall, uh, with a family that size and the wealth that they had, they largely spent their time going from one house to another and celebrating one birthday or another and uh, enjoying each other's company. And at the end of it all, if you remember, Job would make a sacrifice uh, to God in case in the revelry somewhere one of his kids had uh, done something that was offensive to God. And so Job functions not only as the father and the patriarch of this family, but also the priest uh, to the family. So he's a very religious, observant, uh, devout, and pious man. But then, of course, um, the mysterious heavenly council um, that uh, Uh, consisted of God and the angels met and Satan uh, intervened on that meeting uh, from his coming to and fro on the earth and uh, is invited to consider Job and uh, what would happen if Job lost everything. And so God allows Satan to bring torment into uh, Job's life here. His uh, servants are killed and his cattle are uh, killed. That's the uh, first picture. And then uh, all of his family, his uh, sons and daughters and their families are wiped out when a giant windstorm comes and knocks down the house where they're having a party together and, uh, and they are no more which leaves Job in the rather uncomfortable position of rending his garments, which is uh, sort of impossible to do with Lego, but uh, they, you take them off anyway. And uh, he lays there on the ground, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return there. Yahweh, or uh, as our Bibles was, would, would say, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be blessed. And chapter 2 opens, this is where the funny pictures start, <laughs> with um, uh, Job out there in the, um, on the dung heap uh, with, his, um, with his pot shared, his little piece of pottery, and he's scraping himself off uh, uh, because he's, he's kind of Uh, a mess. Uh, We won't go into the gory details. And then his ever-supportive wife comes along (laughs) and uh, puts it quite bluntly to him. And we said last time we were together that, uh, you know, people have tried to pretty this up over the centuries, but I think this is just the Bible being, you know, blunt and honest. You know, she's just having a moment with all of this. And she just looks at Job and she says, look, are you still holding on to your perfect righteousness? Curse God and die already. Just get it over with, you know. And, um, but Job doesn't do it. Job doesn't take his own life. And we had a bit of a discussion about that at the, I think, end of the last 
session that we were together. And uh, anyway, uh, the, that's kind of where that part of the story ends with Job groaning and scraping and his wife crying. And then at the end of uh, the last session, um, three friends had arrived on the scene. And uh, these three men, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, have come to share with Job in his misery. And um, they're, they come with very, very good motivation. They come uh, to, to, to be with him. Uh, in his in his sorrow, uh, breaking down uh, the barrier of isolation, coming and sitting with him for no less than seven full days, as Job lies there in his agony, and uh, they sit there in silence and share in his suffering with him. But then. And we, we uh, saw this last time, Job uh, has his lament in chapter 3, where he goes over all of the things that have happened to him. We won't uh, cover that again this evening. And then the friends begin to speak in response to what uh, Job has shared with them. And they want to share their wisdom and their understandings with, uh, with Job. And probably the best way to put this in, in terms of our own life today is that if you've ever had someone come to you at a particularly bad time in your life and offer you something that was intended to be comforting but really wasn't, or if you've ever been in the position of being there to comfort someone and you say something and you can tell instantly by the look on the other person's face that they have not found this comforting at all, then you get the bit of the sense of the conversation uh, that is going to unfold over many chapters in the book of Job uh, between him and his friends. Now I just put up uh, on, on the screen some of the things that I've heard people say, uh, not always have they said them to me, um, but um, they're, they're all things that people just, just piously, they, they really do intend to be helpful when they say this sort of stuff, but a lot of the time it just doesn't come off as helpful at all when somebody comes up to you and says, I know exactly what you're going through. Well... Uh, only you know exactly what you're going through. Um, I don't. I can try to imagine what it is that you're going through. I can sympathize with what you're going through, but I cannot know exactly what you're going through. I have never had the second one said to me, but I've heard, certainly heard it said and had people come to me and, uh, and, um, and, and rue that somebody said it to them. On the upside, you're young enough to marry again. <laughs> it's just like, right, well, true enough perhaps in the overall scope and scheme of things, but that's not generally speaking what people are thinking about at the moment that somebody blurts out something like that. Or at the death of a loved one, God needed another angel. I've heard that's one, that's an idea that has uh, kind of gotten going in the world these days, that our loved ones, when they pass away, are somehow absorbed into the heavenly host and become angels. Um, that is the stuff of myth and fiction. That is not the stuff of Bible. Uh, our loved ones don't become angels. That just doesn't, that's actually a demotion in the overall scope and scheme of things. Uh, you, we, when we die, we are ourselves, and, uh, and uh, our spirits are with the Lord, and we live in the hope that we will be raised immortal and changed, and um, that is uh, a little higher than the angels. So um, that's just a little crusade I'm on here lately. I have heard a lot of that, and even a couple of the funeral homes here in town, uh, you know, where they identify the pallbearers by giving them a little angel pin, you know, and I'm like, okay, all right, all right. The old 
pallbearer thing worked too. You know, it, it identified you, and uh, and that's and that was fine too. But anyway, and then um, one that we all have used, and um, I have too. Um, and it sounds so right and so biblical. God never gives us more than we can handle. That's crap. <laughs> God always gives us more than we can handle. Um, the, what the Bible verse is that people are referring to here is the Bible verse that talks about God never letting us be tempted beyond our means. That every time we fall into temptation, there's a way out. But we don't often or always take that way out. But that then gets kind of shuffled around and played around with it. God doesn't give us any more than we can handle. God, of course, gives us more than we can handle. Why? Because so we rely on God. You know, that's the whole point of this. You know, um, he, he gives us more than we can handle so that we rely on him. Uh, what this kind of actually betrays is a little bit of, of, of kind of self-idolatry that, you know, well, I should be strong enough to get through this because God won't give me more than I can handle. I should be, I should, you know, I just need to pull myself up by the bootstraps, get my act together, and everything will be fine in my world. Well, uh, yes, there are times when that's what needed. You know, if we're wallowing in self-pity and, and that sort of thing, yeah, maybe we need to kind of pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and, 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 and you know, give ourselves a bit of a talking to and, and, and get on with things. But in the overall scope and scheme of things, yeah, God gives us more than we can handle. I, I firmly believe that. Why? So we trust in him. So we come to him and rely on him and let him be God and let us be us and, uh, and move through that. Anyway, See if we ignited a firestorm of opposition online here. Um, why is it that pastors who give their children biblical names never pick the names of Job's three friends? Well, A, that's a good... <laughs> Yeah, well, for the same reason, we don't pick a few other people's names out of the Bible either, yeah. <laughs> a, we want our children to have friends. <laughs> and B, um, these guys, yeah, they don't, they don't live on in, uh, in, in happy memory. Um, by the end of the, the, the Job story, they, they're fairly well trounced, and some of what they have to say is, is actually um, pretty mean. Um, we, we do, one of our kids was named um, by a confirmation class. I think I've told this story before, but uh, when, when Jonathan was born, um, Susan and I were having a little discussion between us yet. We were quite convinced that uh, he would have been a girl. That's what everybody had said. That's what all the women had said, you know, and the people that look at how, uh, you know, a mom is carrying the child and go, that's a girl for sure, you know. Um, and um, and uh, anyway, um, he, when he was born, he was most definitely not a girl. And, um, and so we were in a bit of a quandary because we had the girl thing all figured out. Boy, we didn't really have yet. And so he was born in the, in the middle of the night, and, and we decided to wait till the next day. And when I went up uh, in the morning to see Susan again, we said, what are we going to name him? And she suggested Joshua, and I suggested Jonathan. And we kind of went at it for, well, not went at it, but, you know, we talked about the merits of each name and that sort of thing. And I said, oh, I know what I'll do this afternoon. Let's think on it. I said, you know, you're, you're still tired, and... and um, I got work and, and I got confirmation this afternoon. So when um, we were in confirmation class that afternoon, I, I said to the kids, I think I had about 15 kids in that class, and I said, uh, you know, we had a baby and, and uh, it was a boy and we had a little trouble with the name, so could you help me here? So I passed out post-it notes to all of the kids and uh, I said, could you write down which of the, these two names that you will be e more eager to be friends with, a Jonathan or a Joshua. And uh, the way that particular group of folks saw it is that uh, uh, if, if there were 15 of them, 13 of them voted for Jonathan, one of them voted for Joshua, and number 15 wrote in Bart. Um, <laughs> as in Bart Simpson. <laughs> I, I went up to Susan that evening in the hospital and I said, you know, 
we phoned the, we, we polled the audience, and, um, and uh, I'm leaning heavily to Jonathan, and so that's how he got his name. So anyway, I don't know. All right, that's, uh, that answered that, and a little extra thrown in for fun. All right, these three guys, when they come, they... Um, the, 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 their speeches cover a long section. If you have the lesson sheet, I'm going to put the chart up on the screen uh, in just a half a second here. Um, the, their speeches all kind of follow um, a, a pattern of, of speaking that was common uh, in the ancient world. Most of their speeches begin with a kind of a rhetorical question. They just sort of you know, what if, and uh, throw out a question, and then they make some comments and observations. And then for the most part, not all of them, in fact, uh, a couple of them definitely not, they try to end it up with um, some comfort, some word of comfort to Job in his situation. And what we have in these speeches is a wonderful... Well, maybe not wonderful isn't the best way to describe it, but an interesting mix of some really good theology and some really bad theology. And it all ties and twists together. And uh, it, it's kind of fun to you know, unpick uh, the little things. One of the sort of unwritten rules of theologizing and, and is that we never use anything these guys say as, as what we would call a proof text for something. So, for example, uh, a proof text is something like John 3.16. You know, uh, how do we know God loves us? Well, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Boom. Easy, easy, clear passage. We don't use anything that Alphaz, Bildad, or Zulfar said as a proof text. Why? Because quite likely the next thing out of their mouth was dead wrong. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so we don't, we don't use them for that sort of a thing. Even the good stuff they said just kind of all gets sort of sealed off in its own little container and we just sort of leave it there and, and study it uh, as, as we're going to do uh, this evening. Now, on the chart is uh, the, the whole cycle of uh, the speeches. And uh, if this just kind of makes your eyes glaze over, don't feel bad. It's probably uh, the way most people uh, would look at this. But there's, there's actually three cycles, or, or well, actually two and two-thirds cycles of, of the speeches. Uh, each of the three speaks to Job, um, and Job responds in turn to each of the three. And then the cycle happens again, uh, each of the three speaks to Job, and uh, Job responds to them again. And then uh, there's one more cycle, and uh, uh, only in the, in the final cycle, Zophar, who we're going to see, um, is, is the guy who has, in many ways, the clearest mind of, of all of them, and who is the least comforting of all of them. He's gotten so disgusted by the time the third cycle rolls around, he's just got nothing to say. He does, he's just washing his hands of Job and the whole problem. If you're not going to listen to the wisdom of, of all of us here, then I'm not going to talk anymore. And he just gets kind of mad and shuts up. And uh, so we don't get a third speech out of Zulfar. Uh, it would have been interesting to hear what he would have had to say, because it would have probably been even more riotous than what he said in the first two uh, of his speeches. Now, if, if you're fe fearful here for a moment that we're going to plod through this speech by speech and response by response, um, I think there's only probably one person in the room uh, and maybe even only one person who's watching this ever who would be kind of intrigued by doing that, and that's me. Um, <laughs> I have a funny feeling, as I said before, if I did this for all the way from chapter 6 to chapter 31, uh, by the time we got to about chapter 8, I'd be here all by myself, and uh, other people would be watching U.S. presidential debates if they ever come back on again. They're, they're certainly more interesting than this. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of look at a summary of what each of the three has to say. Um, each of them has his own uh, kind of consistent message uh, that he has for Job, and we're going to focus in on that message. So 
for Eliphaz. Now, I don't know that, and also I'll say this, I don't know that we're going to get through all of this tonight. We're already at nearly a half an hour through, and if this ends up carrying over into next week, I'm perfectly fine uh, with that. Um, I, I have a point in mind that if we're close to it at, at, at the 8 o'clock, and we're, you know, if we're at this certain point and it's nearly 8 o'clock, that's where we'll stop things uh, for this evening and we'll pick it up from there next time. Okay, first up to bat in the speeches is Eliphaz. And uh, Eliphaz has basically one theme. Um, and, and he repeats it in, in all kinds of different ways. But he, he basically says to Job, uh, my dear friend, you are getting what you deserve. You must be a sinner of some uh, type, and God has chosen to uh, balance the ledger, if you will, taking away from you all of the blessings and now emptying out on you all of, uh, uh, of this problem uh, because you're a sinner and you're getting what you deserve. A good summary verse of, of everything that Eliphaz has to say comes in um, um, Job chapter 4, uh, verses 7 and 8. Remember, who, uh, who, who that was innocent ever perished? Or were the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. So if you do bad things, you're a sinner, you mess up, go against God's will, even though on the outside uh, you seem to be a pretty decent fellow, um, then, uh, you know, th these are the things that happen to people who live like you do. And, um, and he, he, he uh, in, in chapter 5, he, he summarizes it in a, in a somewhat different way. He says, affliction doesn't just come up from the dust, nor does it sprout from the ground, but man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Um, and the, the reason he says that is, you know, what he's saying is, you know, well, Job, we're all sinners, um, and just like sparks can't help but go up, so we're sinners, and trouble just comes to people like us. Why? Well, because we're sinners. And, um, and, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the kind of moral angle he tries to, to work here is to say that, Really what God is trying to do to you, Job, is make you a better person. He's trying to refine you a little bit and, and make you a better uh, person all the way around. And um, Job, of course, uh, protests this. And just, just a little program note here. We aren't going to deal too much tonight with what Job has to say in response. That's next time. We're going to look at Job's responses um, to these uh, to, to the things these guys have to say. Tonight we're just going to look at, at their arguments. Um, and Job, Job continually comes back to Eliphaz and says, no, no, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm a sinner, but I'm not a horrible sinner. I'm not a, a you know, I've, I've made my mistakes, yes, but no more than anybody else. I'm an ordinary guy. I've tried to follow God's ways. And uh, then this actually inflames Eliphaz uh, in his um, uh, last speech, uh, it all kind of comes to a, Each of the speeches gets a little bit more angry. And each of them, you know, in their last speeches are really kind of quite ticked with Job. And he actually invents an entire list of things in, in chapter 25. Um, oh, maybe I'm, I skipped a slide here. Um, oh, no, here it is, yeah. Uh, the way Eliphaz sees this is, is that Job is a grave, a grave sinner, and he actually accuses Job of doing things that uh, Job probably didn't do, um, stripping people of their dignity, um, uh, refusing to feed the hungry, sending widows away empty-handed, not caring for the, the orphans and, and the fatherless. 
And he, either there's no basis in anything we know about Job. We don't know a whole lot about his, his life to, to suggest that these are even remotely things that he was guilty of doing. But Eliphaz has got to make his point. And, uh, you know, uh, he doesn't go into a lot of detail. He doesn't give us, you know, I saw you on this day do this. He just kind of makes these general assertions, um, assuming perhaps because of Job's wealth that, you know, he doesn't have to worry about the, the poor, so he didn't worry about the poor, you know. He didn't, you know, he keeps all these servants. Maybe he doesn't really care about human dignity and all of those sorts of things. And, um, and then from a theological perspective, that's sort of the moral perspective, but just up above it is a kind of a theological perspective on this, that, that God is just. And Job's continual efforts uh, to justify himself, that he is good, he's actually arguing against God. He's saying, you know, God, you're not just. You're, you know, he's arguing against God's justice. And, and, and so not only is, is in, in Eliphaz's mind, is Job a, um, a sinner who's getting what comes to sinners and he should just take it and repent and get his life uh, back together before God and then everything will uh, work out better for him. Uh, he's also offending God with his refusal to admit that he is as grievous a sinner as, um, as, as Eliphaz uh, likes to uh, suggest. So basically, as I said before, uh, the argument uh, is that uh, Job is a sinner. This is to make Job a better man, uh, purify him morally. And if uh, that's what uh, comes out of this, uh, then so be it. And it's all summarized up in one last uh, piece from the, the very end of, of uh, Eliphaz's speeches where he puts it to Job this way. He says, agree with God and be at peace. Thereby good will come to you. Receive instruction from his mouth and lay up words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be built up. If you remove injustice from your tents. So basically, you know, take this as a lesson. Learn the moral of the story. You're a sinner. Get your act together. Come back to God and God will build you back up again. So, is that how God deals with us? The room is quiet. <laughs> Sometimes, it is very easy to draw a cause and effect line between something that we have done or not done and some trouble that has come into our lives. You know, to take an example, uh, if I were to, at the end of the Bible class, help myself to three or four bottles of communion wine uh, before I leave the building, jump in my car, and, uh, you know, uh, wreck my car and maybe break my leg or, or something even worse on the parkway on the way home, yeah, you can draw a pretty easy you know, cause and effect. He, he, he drank too much, he got behind the wheel and he smashed up his car and hurt himself and, you know, he shouldn't do that sort of thing. But in my experience in life um, and, and pastoring, uh, those are the, the exception <laughs> where you can draw those kinds of, you know, fairly straight, easy lines between what somebody is going through and something that they maybe did or didn't do uh, that brought it upon themselves. Uh, but that doesn't mean we don't go looking for it. Um, there's a couple of examples uh, from Jesus' ministry in the New Testament. Um, the, the best one, perhaps, is in, in John chapter 9, but it's certainly not the only one. In John chapter 9... Um, 
Jesus and his disciples um, confront or are confronted by a man who was born blind. And uh, this is one of a series of conversations that uh, we actually just uh, worked our way through this past Lent uh, in, in the gospel readings. Um, and, uh, and, and Jesus has these conversations on his way uh, to Jerusalem and to his death. And, uh, and, and uh, in this particular case, his disciples raised the question. This is John chapter 9, verses 1 uh, and 2 and 3. Um, As he went along, uh, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What the disciples are trying to do is, is, is the same kind of thing that Eliphaz tries to do with Job. We have someone who's suffering, in this case, blindness from birth. Whose fault is it? that this has happened to him? Is this because of something he did, though hard to uh, picture that, given that he's been this way since, since his birth? Or is this a, a really a punishment on his parents for something they did, that they should have to raise a child who, who cannot see and who's going to be basically in that uh, culture, a dependent of theirs all his uh, life for the rest of their lives. Uh, what, what, who sinned here? And Jesus answers, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Now, part of that answer, the second part about the work of God being displayed in his life is a little, a little cryptic, a little hard to just kind of grasp right away. And, and, but, it, but it becomes clearer as the story goes on that the work of God is going to be to heal this man and uh, to use this man as a, as a disciple of Jesus who will even uh, stand up and testify against the Pharisees and the scribes and everyone who ultimately throws him out of the synagogue because he got himself healed uh, by Jesus. But the, the key line for our purposes this evening is that this isn't his fault. This isn't his parents' fault. But God has allowed this to come into his life for God's own reasons, uh, not something that we can just kind of point to them and say they did a bad thing and they're getting punished for that. And, um, and, and, and Jesus discourages us, I think, from making those very simple kind of simplistic cause and effect you know, oh, they must have done something wrong or, the, you know, God is getting back at them for how they've lived or something like that. Um, that's not how God operates. God indeed allows suffering to come into people's lives. In, time, in fact, he's sometimes the, the bringer of the suffering into people's lives, but it's never, 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 never uh, as a, you know, a direct punishment uh, on on their sinfulness. Although, as I said before, there are those occasions where you can say, yeah, okay, this happened because somebody did something over here. And, and you, can, you can more easily connect the dots. But, you know, for those things that are not so easy on the surface, like, you know, why does a child get sick and pass away? Uh, why does a, a spouse, you know, become ill and, and, and lose their job and, and have to become a dependent? Why does, why does uh, you know, all these things happen? Um, th- that, that's actually law thinking, you know, to think, well, okay, it's something I did. God is punishing me. God is, uh, you know, uh, settling the scores with me here. I didn't know how good I had it, and God's now you know, cutting me down to size or something like that. No, that's not how God operates at all. Uh, you know, we don't always know why it is. But as, as he says here, Jesus says here, this is, this is so God's work might be revealed in us. You know, as I said, to maybe to go back 
uh, to the beginning comments I made about God giving us more than we can handle. Sometimes God does absolutely give us more than we can handle. Uh, so that his work might be displayed in us. Okay, we'll see what we have for online debate here. Nothing so far. Okay. Either we've completely answered the questions. Okay, Sue, we have, a, we have uh, from the live audience. <laughs> Go ahead, you're on the air. Is this a typical thing that happened when, in that time, when people were dying, that uh, people would try and go and sort of uh, convert people to be uh, more Christian or their religion? More spiritual or more trusting Christian. in God? Yeah, um, probably. I think people do this all the time. I mean, I, I don't know how many times I've heard it. Um, you know, when I visit somebody in the hospital and they've just gotten some, you know, difficult diagnosis or they're going through a, a tough time and they go, I, I must have done something to bring this on myself. You know, it's a very just natural human thing to look at what did I do to bring this on to me? Or, what, you know, uh, it's again part of our uh, Luther's description of sin uh, that I, I just love is that sin just curves us in on ourselves. It makes us think and look at ourselves first. And so um, this, uh, that curved in the nature of sin, I think, is what, um, what makes it so that we want to do that. And then even when we're helping others, to get back to your question, which was, you know, is this, is this why... You know, did people, did people in the ancient world try to do this? You know, yeah, yeah, they, they did. Why? Because it's, you know, we, we, we like to think there's got to be some sort of I did or, yeah, we got to try to rationalize everything. Yeah, yeah. And then the older I get, the more I'm learning. There's not all as much can be rationalized as I once thought. <laughs> can't be so easily explained. <laughs> Sometimes, you, as I said, you can, you can find the, the, the explanations, but they're not always so easy. Yes, I see a hand up on the balcony, sir. Well, yeah, the program. Yeah. There are some things that we do or we can do that bring about these things. You know, if we have a lifestyle choice, whether it's drinking or overeating, there are consequences of that too. So it's not necessarily God getting back at us or me, you know, hurting us because of it. But there are certain things that if you do something, your Absolutely. consequences are, are there. They're natural yeah. consequences. Yeah, just, just to sort of repeat into a microphone what you're saying, unless you have a secret mic up there. You didn't use one. Okay. Um, uh, so, but what, what Claude was saying is that sometimes, yeah, as, as I was saying before too, there are, you know, if, if we, you know, abuse our bodies in some sort of way, yeah, then trouble's going to come. I mean, and then you can kind of see it. But, um, you, you know, those are, the, those are the situations where it's a little easier to, to kind of say, okay, you know, you, you can have that heart-to-heart -heart talk with somebody about, look, if you want to be rid of this, you know, there's a, some changes you need to make. Um, uh, but uh, on, on the other hand, those, are, those aren't, uh, you know, the, 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 those aren't, in my experience pastorally, those aren't the majority of the situations. <laughs> More often than not, it's, it's there's, there's, you know, humanly speaking, we don't get reasons. And to dump it on somebody and say this is because of you or your sin is, um, is just adding to their misery in a huge, huge way. All right. So that's Eliphaz. Let's check again to see. Yeah, we're sailing on in terms of the folks at home. All right. Bringing us to Bildad, who I uh, said before, uh, shortest man in the Bible. Um, ha, ha, ha. Bildad the Shuhite, he's called in one of the earlier descriptions of him there. And uh, Bildad comes at this from a, another perspective that is very uh, common, uh, even in the world uh, yet today. Uh, Bildad's basic argument was, Job, 
The problem isn't with your sin. The problem is that you don't have a very strong relationship with God. If you really had enough faith, Job, um, this wouldn't be happening to you, which is something that I have heard said to people. Um, and uh, people struggle when somebody says this. Don't ever say that to somebody. I'll just say that right off the bat. That's another one of those ones that I could have, you know, put at the beginning. Don't ever say to someone in the midst of their troubles, this, this is because you don't have enough faith. Oh, anyway, um, does God pervert justice? This is a little, just a little quote that the uh, Lego uh, Bible people have here. Uh, God would not forsake a perfectly righteous man nor give aid to an evildoer. He picks up some of the same themes as Eliphaz, but he does it from the perspective of faith. And uh, he basically makes two arguments. Oops. Um, argument one uh, is, is found in his uh, first speech in Job chapter 8. Um, and uh, basically, it's that uh, despite all the outward appearances of Job's piety, um, uh, it, it, Job has forgotten God. That's his basic argument. He says, can papyrus grow where there is no marsh? Can reeds flourish where there is no water? While yet in flower and not cut down, they wither before any other plant. Such are the paths of those who forget God. The hope of the hopeless shall perish. His confidence is severed. His trust is a spider's web. So basically he's saying, you know, if, you know a lot of times you're in, in life, we're like the reeds that wither and they're cut down. And that only happens to you when you forget about God. And if you don't want to have that happen to you, then don't forget about God. And, uh, and uh, then your hope won't perish. Um, your confidence won't be severed. The whole problem, Job, is that your trust is like that of a spider's web. You know, just very blowing in the wind there. And uh, not, you know, I mean, spider's webs have their own strength. But, you know, we wouldn't look at, at the spider's web, obviously, as being an example of something that just holds everything up for forever. Uh, it just can't do that. It's not made to do that. And then the second part of the argument from his second speech is that, God, that Job just doesn't really even know God. You know, for again, for, despite his outward piety and his, his, uh, his desires to, to, you know, make the sacrifices for his kids and lead an outwardly godly, godly life. Um, uh, here's, here's his description um, of, of Job's situation and why it happens. Um, he is thrust, and this is, he's speaking about Job here. Job is thrust from light into darkness and driven out of the world. He has no posterity or progeny, no children, which is true at this point in time, among his people, and no survivor where he used to live. They of the West are appalled at his day, and horror seizes them in the East. They, people are looking at him and hearing his story, and they're, they're, they're completely shook up by this. Well, such is, uh, this is the, what happens, he says, to the unrighteous. Such is the place of him who knows not God. So his argument is that uh, the whole problem, Job, is a spiritual problem. You know, um, if you had more faith, you're closer in your relationship to God, these bad things wouldn't happen to you. But, you know, you obviously don't have enough faith. Uh, you, you're not close with God, and, you know, God's just, that's the way it is. So, is that how God treats us? Getting some shaking of heads here in the church, which is a good thing. <laughs> no, that's not how God uh, uh, treats us at all. In fact, he often speaks, Jesus does, of, you know, that someone, you know, example, uh, with faith as small as the mustard seed, so to speak can tell that mountain to 
go into the sea. And, and uh, he's always going around um, building up the weak in faith, not meeting out punishment upon them because of their lack of faith. It's the disciples who, in a couple of instances, James and John, in one particularly memorable case, when they come across a town that doesn't want to have anything to do with Jesus, doesn't believe in Jesus, James and John want to rain down thunder on the place and rain down fire from heaven on the town and wipe it out um, because it, um, they, they've rejected Jesus. But Jesus says, no, no, no. No, no, no. No need to do that. And even when he points out the smallness of faith, which Jesus is not afraid to do sometimes, and he, he talks about uh, his own disciples having uh, weak faith um, and, uh, and you know, this generation having weak faith, um, he does it not to condemn them. Certainly, uh, he's pointing out the error or the problem. But he's doing it in, a, in, in always in a loving way to bring them along in their faith and not to destroy them because of their, the littleness of their faith. And when uh, someone prays to him and says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, which is a kind of a confession of the smallness of faith, he's right there to help them out, and to lift them up again. So in, in the bigger picture of the Bible story, um, that's never God's way. There's, there's other examples in the, in the Old Testament as well. Uh, one that comes to mind is the story of Elijah. And, um, and his, uh, he gets so exasperated in his ministry, this is in 1 Kings 19, that he, he prays that God would just let him die already. I'm so tired of ministering to these people. They don't listen. You know, I'm just ready to die. And there he is in the, the wilderness. And, and, you know, what does God come and do? God comes and feeds him, strengthens him up again, takes him down to uh, the mountain of the Lord, Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, and speaks with him, sends him back, you know, doesn't kick him around the block, you know, for being, being that way. Elroy, did you have a question? I saw the hand. You looked like you were at the auction, uh, uh, but not sure whether you wanted to bid or not. I was thinking of the messianic promise from Isaiah, I think, about this smoldering wet door. Right, oh, very good, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely, yes. Uh, um, um, uh, the... the uh, um, the, the uh, Elroy just pointed out the... the um, the, the passage from Isaiah 42, uh, you know, the smoldering wick he will not snuff out and the bruised reed he will not break. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that, that's fulfilled in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. We like to link up cause and effect, you know, and uh, if it's sin or lack of faith, you know, that, that's a very human kind of way of, of dealing with things. But uh, uh, who is the scientist who divided, d discovered that? I can't remember. The, the guy that's responsible for the balls that bounce back and forth. And I don't remember him anyway, but, you know, cause and effect. You know, you hit it on one side, it's going to bounce off on the other side. But Newton. Okay. All right. We'll believe you. Probably get emails on that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor, you know it should have been so-and-so. Okay. All right. Well, if these two guys aren't enough for you, um, Zophar, the last of them, uh, he, really, he really takes the cake. Um, he's listened uh, to both Eliphaz and to Bildad, and he's listened to both of Job's responses to them. And then he lets into Job with a pretty good um, uh, little speech himself. And it's basically... Uh, Job, the, really, this should be worse. <laughs> Cheer up. <laughs> What's really due you is far worse than anything that you are going through. And the little Lego uh, guys picked that up. They said, 
is all this talk to go unanswered? How I wish God would speak and reveal to you his wisdom. For then you will know that God has punished you less than your sin actually deserved. <laughs> That's the kind of guy you want to have come over, you know. Uh, you know, the death of a loved one, he brings a casserole, um, you know, but he tells the card says, you know, cheer up, you know, <laughs> it should be worse than this, you know. I mean, there's, there's a kind of comfort we're all looking for uh, in this world. Um, as, as I say on the, the lesson handout, you know, he basically believes that Job is just an ignorant fool, and his whole focus um, is to convict Job of sin because the only way that blessing can be restored in Zophar's mind is uh, for Job to live a life um, without uh, sin. And uh, he, he's actually very cruel uh, to, to, to Job and, and goes into great lengths about how um, uh, he just goes through Job's sufferings basically, and says, this is all, uh, just get what's, what's coming to you. Uh, just a couple of other quick, um, quick quotes from, from Zophar. Uh, if you prepare your heart, uh, you will stretch out your hand toward him. If iniquity is in your hand, put it away. Don't let ju injustice dwell in your tent. Uh, surely then you will lift up your face without blemish, and you will be secure and will not fear you will forget your misery and remember it as the waters that have passed away. If, that's the big word in this particular, um, in, in his uh, thing. If you do this, if you um, prepare your heart, if you flee from iniquity, then everything uh, will work for you. And um, his second speech um, which I didn't actually include on a slide on the overhead, but is on your lesson sheet. Uh, it's just, he just absolutely unloads on Job. He's angry, he's bitter, he's frustrated. And um, he just says to Job at the end of his speech, he said, this is the wicked man's portion from God, the heritage decreed for him by God. Boom. There you go. <laughs> and Job's answer to all of this, I love this next slide. This whole class is worth it for the very next slide because if you didn't think Lego had expression, oh yes, Lego has expression. <laughs> you are worthless physicians, all of you, he says. If only you would keep silent, that would be wisdom um, for you. Now listen to my argument. May God kill me, but I will nonetheless defend my ways to his face. <laughs> so, I just love the expression they put on his face. That's just, that's just so, <laughs> I have had enough of you guys. And he is going to, um, he's going to speak. And, and next time, we will, um, we will dig into what Job has to say in response to these guys. Because the wonderful thing, is, while we can't get a lot of comfort out of what these three guys have to say, um, there are some wonderful, absolutely wonderful confessions of faith that Job makes in his responses to these people that are promises that you and I can hang on to in the times of our suffering. And uh, we'll mine those out next time, as well as what's left on our sheet here, um, which we, it will take me a little while to go through, so rather than keep everybody up way past their bedtime, and me especially, um, we'll, we'll stop it here. Elroy, you have another comment or question? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 
yeah. Yeah, uh, Elroy, in case you couldn't hear through my microphone, is just commenting that uh, in spite of his, his illness, Job had a fair level of uh, stamina to be able to carry on and uh, you know, argue back and forth with these guys. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, he does. Yeah, he's got a, a strength there that, um, that is, um, is, is kind of remarkable. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any last-minute questions from anybody in the room here? Yeah, Sandy. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, Shelley just makes the comment that in, in today's world, we don't often look even to ourselves as being the cause of, 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 of sin. Sometimes it's, oh, somebody did this. And, you know, the, 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 the kind of the, the uh, how shall I say it, the culture of victimization. You know, everybody's a victim of something. You know, well, yeah, okay. Um, but that doesn't give you necessarily license to, you, again, you can't always make those simple connections. It's another attempt we like to do, you know, maybe to shift it from ourselves and go, okay, it's not me. This is because somebody did something to me here and I've been abused somehow in that process. Well, yeah, okay. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the hard part of that is that uh, uh, who among us has not, you know, had those moments, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Any other comments, observations? All right. I've either bored you to death or, uh, or, or something. I don't know. Anyway, if you want to read ahead for next time, what, one of the things I wanted to, to use this class as an opportunity to do and had built into the end of this lesson, but it will now become the beginning of the next, is to examine a little bit of Luther's thinking on, on suffering and how we live in a world that is filled with suffering and, and, and to explore something that uh, Luther uh, is very, we owe great debt of gratitude to him and to God for, for bringing to light something called the theology of the cross. And the theology of the cross in its, its essence is that, that God is not always seen in this world in the things that we can see um, and in the blessings that we receive. Certainly he's there. But that we actually see God more clearly in suffering and given a greater glimpse of, of, of uh, his nature and the way he deals with us. Luther wrote and thought a lot about this and I've tried to distill down uh, a lot of words into some, some key points. And that's where we'll pick it up next time. And then we'll deal with Job's uh, theologizing back to his friends again and pick up his wonderful confessions of faith. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do not treat us as our sins deserve. And that when our faith is weak, you are not one to cut us off or, or snuff us out, but that you build us up. And we thank you for that faithful love that you give to us. And we pray that you would help us in those moments where we can reach out and uh, care for those around us, that you would uh, keep us from those answers that we've talked about this evening that were given to Job. Answers that really focus on ourselves and that take our eyes off of you. Uh, we pray that you would continue to bless our study and uh, help us to grow in our faith as we consider all of this that happened to Job so long ago, that uh, we too might be strengthened in the difficult days and weeks and years of our own lives. Bless us now as we come to the end of this day. Uh, grant us good night's rest and refreshment so that tomorrow we might serve you with joy for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right, if you have a question during the week, don't hesitate to shoot an email or give me a phone call. I'm more than happy to kind of deal with those and uh, answer questions as they come along. So uh, feel free to share and we'll gather together, God willing, next, uh, next Wednesday evening, same time, same channel. So.